Okay, I think we are ready to get started with our webinar today. Just a heads up, if you have any questions, feel free to utilize the chat function or you can feel free to ask any questions in our Q&A, which we will answer at the end of the webinar. So let's get started here. Um, our webinar today is hosted by NetBees, but it is an interview with EMA's Seamus McGillicuddy and Brian Conine, and I will let Greg go a little bit more into that and introduce those two. So take it away, Greg. Hey, thanks, Jess. So you guys all recognize Seamus, right, from uh, EMA and then TechTar. He's been in the IT industry for a long time. He's covered a lot of trends. Um, he had the opportunity recently to talk to Brian Kaneen, who's both CIO and CTO at Marlette Funding. And uh, Brian's got a little bit more gray hair, as I learned, uh, than in this picture. Um, but, you know, he's been around the block as well with uh, stints at um, Oracle and uh, a lot of large organizations. But he's been at uh, Marlette through some pretty heady growth periods since 2013. Next slide, please. So NetBees was founded in 2013, really focused on remote and on-premise network monitoring with more than 100 customers. Uh, inspired by, you see the slide to the right, the shortcomings of like the existing network monitoring plays, visibility limited to device status. So a lot of time was lost on root cause analysis, no insight into user experience, and on, you know, uh, uh, reporting delayed and fragmented, uh, user reporting, you know, you you were kind of at the mercy of users to find out the problems. And then oftentimes having to deliver specialized skills needed on vacation, which, you know, drives up travel costs and right, waste resources. So Stefano and the other two co-founders basically developed an architecture very much focused on user experience with, you know, obviously getting, you know, raw data for insight and then allowing the, you know, network engineers and help desk teams to diagnose problems oftentimes even before you know the employees users would notice them so Seamus why don't you take it from here okay uh greetings everyone um so the premise of this of, of this webinar to some extent is just looking at the fact that um it's been a tremendous growth and a number of people who are working from home on a part-time or full-time basis uh, due to the pandemic. I do uh, four or five market research studies, market research studies every year where I survey network engineering and operations professionals about a variety of topics. Um, and uh, I've asked them a couple times over the last um, six to eight months, what is going on with their work from home population, the people who they have to support in home offices as opposed to, you know, campus and, and branch. Uh, and we found the majority of enterprises definitely experienced a spike in the number of employees who are working from home during the pandemic. That's not going to be a surprise to any of you. Um, but we also found that most of them expect that spike is going to be permanent to some extent. They, they admitted that some people might go back to full-time on-site employment, but many more are never going back to the office uh, or only going back to the office occasionally for meetings, uh, to collaborate on certain projects, things like that. But in terms of like day-to-day -day work, a lot of people are going to be permanently situated in a home office and, and there are a variety of reasons for that there's they've they've seen that productivity is not negatively impacted by um working from home in fact some people many people become more productive uh they tend to uh spend more time working because they don't they don't have the pressure of commuting you know they they're, they're not trying to get out and beat the traffic they're 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 already home they're comfortable um people are just more productive uh, and, 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 and it's related to that. There's um, a work-life bonus, uh, it's a work-life balance that, that you know, might make some of your employees just 
more uh, relaxed and and happy and 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 being able to you know fit fit their job into their lives more. Um, and 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 on the flip side, uh, with fewer people in the office, you, I've talked to many uh, IT organizations who are changing their their corporate networks in response to the fact that they're retire their 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 companies are retiring real estate. They're consolidating, or they're changing the way they use the real estate. Um, but the, yeah, when you have to maintain fewer desks, uh, you can save money on the amount of floors you have in a building. Uh, you might be. I've, I've talked to people who've closed some of their their branch offices and focused most of their real estate spending in their corporate headquarters. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, now, I talked to this one network architect at a hundred billion dollar bank. Uh, a week or so ago, and he he told he, he he acknowledged that working from home has created a visibility gap for him. Like this quote is from him. He says, "I don't think we have enough visibility to support working from home. We need to fix monitoring for everyone, but instead we've been focused on fixing monitoring just for one person at a time." So, you know, like oh, we, um, one guy told me he's been turning on like he had a a um, a VPN agent that could produce NetFlow. Right, um, and so he was turning that on in certain cases on a case by case basis um, to get some visibility um, from the home office. But everyone is, you know, trying to figure out what's what are their, what are, what are going to be the new tooling strategies if you go from monitoring, you know, a few corporate locations to trying to support the end user experience of thousands of home office environments. It's it's a totally different situation. Um, you might find yourself with some blind spots because in most cases you can't pull those home office net, uh, environments with SNMP. You don't have any network hardware in place. Um, and, and you, despite what one guy told me about turning on NetFlow on a VPN client, um, most people do not have options for generating NetFlow from an office to give you traffic insight. You're not gonna have packet capture appliances in home offices. You need new tools, right? Um, and we're finding in my research that there's a lot of interest in tools that can generate um, active test traffic, um, synthetic traffic to test the networks and see how the network is supporting end user experience instead of pulling stats on device uh, state or, or trying to understand uh, traffic from a passive point of view. Um, also a lot of interest in endpoint monitoring, what's going on on the endpoint. Um, my research has also asked people recently what kinds of network operations Work, work from home performance insights they need, right, uh, for these home offices. Um, and these are the four that rose to the top that emerged as really important to them. They want to know how the application is performing uh, at, the, at the, you know, at the, at the center of the network, whether that's your data center or your cloud. They want to, but they also need to know about ISP availability and performance. Uh, VPN concentrated utilization performance and home Wi-Fi performance. Now, two of these app performance in the data center and the cloud is mostly addressed by your existing tool sets. You know, if you have a lot of SaaS applications, that's a different story. Um, and VPN concentrated utilization, utilization and performance generally can point whatever performance monitoring tool you have in your data center at that and get the visibility you need. But when it comes to ISP availability performance and home Wi-Fi performance, you, you're not, you probably don't have tools to address that right now for the home office environment. Uh, and, and, and this comes up in conversations over and over again with network engineers and architects, and network operations managers. They tell me that the thing they need to be able to do is to know, is it the ISP or the home office Wi-Fi? They can't answer that question. And, you know, and trying to answer that question across hundreds or thousands of people is killing them and it's killing uh, user satisfaction. So with that in mind, we're gonna go and pivot towards Brian now and talk about what 
our conversation entailed in terms of like what he did to address these issues. But first, and first I'm gonna let him talk about uh, Best Egg Marlet founding, give you an introduction to where he's from. Uh, thanks Seamus, thanks for the invite. I appreciate uh, getting a chance to speak to everyone today. So just quickly about myself, I am the a CIO CTO. Um, they wouldn't let me put Jedi Grandmaster in my title, so I had to pick uh, something a little more established of uh, Marlet Funding, which is the, uh, the company behind Best Egg Personal Loans. Uh, Best Egg Personal Loans was launched in March of 2014, so a little over seven years ago. Uh, we are an online personal loan business expanding into other uh, credit uh, facilities and financial health uh, offerings as well. And in the last seven years, we've done $11.5 billion. And as of this morning, six across 650,000 unit customers. It's a very simple, uh, you know, unsecured personal loan. Customer applies completely digitally. And that's kind of a five to 10 minute process. And they can you know, get the proceeds as little as the next day. And that's that's all you guys need to hear about about Best Egg. I'm not trying to sell you on a personal loan, although you know if, you, if you're interested in one, definitely check out the website. Uh, but you know, since founding, we grew to about 250 people uh, and full-time employees uh, pre-COVID, uh, and primarily 95% of them were working in the Wilmington, Delaware office, uh, and 95% of them were going into the office at least three or more days a week. We were a very office-centric culture and company uh, prior to pandemic, so you can imagine. Uh, that was a huge shift for us as we switched from then to uh, work from home. So uh, that's my, my background and kind of setting the stage. Oh, sorry, I got ahead of the slides. Uh, it's a common right, problem okay. with me. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we had 250 employees. Um, we are very dedicated to over-investing in infrastructure. Um, I think about network speed and access and availability like oxygen. Uh, no one complains about it until there's not enough of it. And we always wanted to stay ahead of that. So our office network for what is a medium-sized company was incredibly advanced. Uh, multiple gigabits up and down of internet, super high-speed internet, Wi-Fi repeaters everywhere. Um, we were always very focused on don't make that a problem. We don't want the, the, the person's problem of the day to be the internet at the office isn't working correctly. And we, got, we felt very good about where we were pre-pandemic. We had a great system. Uh, great uh, service levels. Our help desk was helping people whenever there was an issue. And then, you know, we quickly uh, had to switch from that one centralized office to what essentially became 250 um, people working from home in the course of about seven days. Um, and so what that looked like was about 150 employees who we typically call strategy employees. So what you typically think of a full-time employee at any business, and then 100 employees are call center agents using soft phones. Uh, these all were in the office previously uh, through multiple floors of our building. And now every single one of these folks was working remotely from home across uh, every ISP possible in the tri-state uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware area uh, with every combination of Wi-Fi brand and repeater and router uh, and every type of living situation from, you know, having a one room in an apartment that you're sharing with three other people to being in a, you know, 3000 square foot family home and your office is tucked in the basement because your wife won't let you come out of it. Uh, I'm not talking from personal experience at all. Um, so that was kind of the gamut of, of the transition that we, that we made. And uh, what happened to us immediately was exactly what Seamus was referencing was, oh man, we have no visibility into what is happening. Uh, all the employee would tell us, you know, it would be a call center agent and they are on the front lines fighting the fight for us every day with the customers, give the customers that great experience. They'd be like, I don't know what's why, why it's not working, but my phone, my soft phone isn't working. I can't take calls. Um, I can't log into the application to check the customer's account. All sorts of issues. And the only thing the employee told us, and that's totally valid, is it's not working. Fix it. And now I have this group of, of help desk folks trying to do their best with no visibility into each customer's situation, each of their customers, which is our employee situation. So it's, you know, we're using tools like can you open, you know, fast.com or speedtest.net. Uh, do you know how to run ping? And they, the, the employees would be like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I was sitting here scratching my head going, we can't solve this problem one employee at a time. You know, we were doing the best and I, I felt like we were doing better than most probably were, but it was still not a great employee uh, or uh, overall company experience. And that's when we basically found NEPIs. And one question to have is like, um, you mentioned like trying to get home 
your, your, your employees to use something like ping or speed test or something like that. Were you, were you use, were your team using anything on their end before they looked at NetBees? So we had, you know, some basic monitoring, obviously all of our devices were remotely, uh, you know, centrally controlled, you know, with, you know, you know, all the different kinds of levels of security and infrastructure we had, but almost all of our infrastructure prior to the pandemic was focused on optimizing our office network and obviously giving employees the ability to VPN in, but the VPN use case was a very limited use case. And, you know, if an employee had problems, they would, you know, it would be transient and, you know, it would only be a couple at a time. And so we had insight, but limited insight and a lot of our tools focusing on the local LAN versus, you know, individual employees. So that's really the wall we kept running into is like we found ourselves, the help desk found themselves saying, can you take a screenshot of the results of fast.com? Can you open a command prompt and write this? And then still, even with that information, they're sitting there scratching their head going, I don't know if it's the ISP. I don't know if it's the Wi-Fi signal. I don't know if it's the computer. I don't, I have all these different things uh, that I have no insight into. And previously they would just walk over to the, to the employee and say, Hey, let's sit down and figure it out together. And now, you know, not even if they wanted to, even if we allowed them to interact, they literally couldn't because of the pandemic. So everything was remote and distant and we were really struggling uh, to figure out a solution. And that's when I started Googling uh, my fingers off looking for a solution and I, I ran across NetBees. Yeah, in one of my research projects recently, I asked what kinds of tools they were using to support these home workers. And one of the top responses was remote desktop access. So they're, you know, IT ops is, is individually logging into each user's desktop remotely, probably to run the ping test, you know, or to like, you know, maybe force quit an application or whatever, you know, like troubleshooting remotely. It's not ideal. And I would say that the, the thing that was most frustrating was that, you know, we went from a company who used video conferencing you know, similar to Zoom, that wasn't the product that we used, but that we're all using today on, on the webinar, um, you know, occasionally for the remote employee or the person dialing into a conference to being completely on co video conferencing in a meeting center culture where, you know, there is no tolerance for, I can't hear the person, they're breaking up, oh, what's going on? And what would happen is we would get reports of, I was in a meeting and it didn't work, but by the time we got to the person, the, the, a transient issue might be gone. So we not only you know the tools we had were barbaric and and limited; they were not historic. There was no trending. There was no analysis. So even by the time we finally got to the person, maybe the problem was gone. Maybe it was transient. And then you'd be in you know we'd find ourselves in arguments. You know, not necessarily arguments because the customer is always right, but internal arguments in our head going, "Is it our problem? Was it the user's internet? Was it the third-party video conferencing software?" Because the quick answer everyone just said was. Um, Conference software X is broken. That was the that was every ticket was the, the conference software isn't working. And, and that became the kind of the bane of our existence because you have a meeting centric culture. Everyone is trying to use video meetings. And the only feedback you get is the conference software isn't working. Uh, and I don't blame the users. You know, once we got kind of the soft phone issues figured out for the agents, that was the next biggest complaint. And without any sort of historical look back, man, we were in trouble because you know, a lot of Wi-Fi and network issues are intermittent, they're not consistent. And that was another thing we were really looking for was the ability to trend over time and, and then log, go back in and you know, synchronize a ticket and the time the ticket happened to the actual performance of the, net, the user's device. Brian, that was such a CIO thing to say, I don't blame the users. Uh, <laughs> you go further down the reporting chain and the, 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 that response is different. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> anyway. Um, let's talk about how you got into using NetBees. Like, what what prompted you to take a look at them, and what what made what what value did they see when you were checking them out? Absolutely. So, uh, as I was saying, I was googling my little fingers off because on my disposal, on my personal desktop that I was working from, I had things like Ping Plotter, and I understood websites I could go to, and I understood latency, and I had complete visibility into my network. So, even when I was having problems, I felt like I have all these tools at my disposal but I don't have them collectively for my organization. And yes, I think, you know, my, my help desk folks were definitely using remote desktop as much as they could, but it doesn't give you a collective holistic picture and it only is in reactionary instead of proactionary. So, you know, we were reacting to incidents and issues after the user complained about them 
far as proactively monitoring things. So I was stuck in my head going, there has to be a better solution. And I, I, I don't know, I sent two or three hours Googling, uh, trying to figure out, and it just, everything I ran into was more around, you know, network infrastructure in a data center, um, you know, or it'd be like, oh, you could install speed tests on everyone's device, but it was not aligned to this idea that I wanted to be able to do speed tests, you know, ping, packet loss. I wanted to be able to do it to arbitrary servers and also like known servers, because it would very, for a call center agent, it's really important for me to know, like, how is their connection to our our cloud-based, you know, dialing system. Is that a good connection? Because, or how is our connection to our conferencing system? Two totally different systems. How is our connection to our software that's sitting in AWS? And I wanted to be able to monitor all of those so I could isolate, is it a issue to their, to, to their local network? Is it a systematic issue? Is it an internet issue and a backbone, et cetera? So that's when I found that because I, I believe when I found you guys, it was very early days for your individual device user uh, software being configured, and we were probably one of the first users to uh, deploy it. Cool. And so, uh, so you, you you saw the 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 value of being able to get a remote user experience from it. There was obviously an interest in raw data feeds, um, and obviously NetBees also offered a, a central management console that that allowed you to sort of see all your users or the users of interest and see who's having trouble. Is that, could you elaborate on that a bit? Exactly. So we, kind of, we, we set it up that we had what we consider to be roles or groups. And so our agents taking phone calls were in one group and had one set of things we were checking and monitoring against, you know, overall speed, latency, ability to connect to certain servers. Our executives were in another group. Um, they had different concerns and issues and we were, you know, highly sensitive that if an executive was having a problem, um, to make sure that we are in front of it because the, they don't have any time to spend trying to help us diagnose it. And then finally is like kind of the general user base. And what we then split those three groups into like two modes of operation. There's reactionary, like, you know, research and diagnosis. Oh, we just got a ticket that they were having a problem with conferencing. Let's pull up NetBees and look at what was going on during that time with their connection. Does the connection look good? Connection looks good. Let's go open a ticket with the video conferencing solution, because by the way, every video conferencing solution in the world was getting slammed. And it was just as equal to be a user problem in their house as it was actual video conferencing solution problem because of scaling and demand. And so that would help us narrow it down in a reactionary. Proactionary, we had users going in and logging in and looking at, hey, who's trending and having problems just with the stability of their connection? So then we could reach out to them. Sometimes the answer was as simple as, here's a 100 foot ethernet cable. Can you please plug your laptop directly into your router? And that would solve the problem. Other times it would be, hey, we're going to give you a stipend. Can you please upgrade your connection? Other times it might be literal device problem or something else. And so we, we balanced our efforts to manage these 250 distinct environments, both reactionary to problems, but proactionary, proact proactive. I made up the word proactionary and no one called me on it, which I appreciate, but proactively, uh, you know, to kind of balance the thing so we get out ahead of it. And obviously certain users, we kept a very close eye on. Someone who had a problem in the past, we would check in every so often to see if that problem is resolved or is reoccurring again. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, and I would just say, I don't know if this is a common CIO problem or not, but um, my, my CEO doesn't know what our ticketing system looks like. His ticketing system is he texts me every time there's a problem with anything in our in our infrastructure whatsoever. And he says, Brian, I don't want to bother you, but here's my problem. Um, that's how he always starts. I don't want to bother you, but here's my problem. And that's his ticket system. So that was definitely someone we're paying close attention to. Yeah. So you're able, so, so, you're, so now like when you have the conference set up, you, you, you're able to not only create profiles for different types of users, but also individual users of importance. Uh, you're probably also able to, to see like applications that are critical to your business or websites that are critical to your business? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like I said, we have a conferencing provider. We have a, a voice over IP provider for our agents taking calls from customers. We have our own custom app sitting in AWS and we monitor connections to all of those. Different profiles have different collections and we can make sure that there's not a systemic problem for that customer, for that user getting to that endpoint. Um, and by the way, like this was something we did for COVID and the pandemic, but we're looking, I told you earlier that we were 95% working from an office three days or more a week. Our best estimates, uh, we're opening our new office in July. Our best estimates go forward, are, we're going to be 50-50. 
50% uh, of our users might come into the office three days or more a week, and 50% of the users are probably going to work from home three days or more a week. And that's fine. We don't have a problem with that. We understand that's the new normal. And so this is not a temporary solution to a problem. This is an ongoing approach that we need to take as we go forward. I got in front of the sides again. That's, that's, how, I, that's how I do it. Um, that's, this is an ongoing approach that we're going to need to take forever. We don't believe that this is changing. Um, you know, we might, maybe after a year or two, it swings back up to 60% of people going into the office three or more days a week. But we believe that for lots of good reasons that Seamus uh, talked about in the beginning of, of the, the session, um, there's lots of benefits. Like and the way I've been describing to folks who've been asking me, because you can imagine anytime you talk to an employee, one of their first questions these days is, hey, what's going on with going back to the office? What's our plan? What's our strategy? And what I tell them what we're aiming for is I want an employee to be able to wake up in the morning, you know, pick up their phone, look at their calendar and go, is this a good day for me to go in or stay home? And that can be for a variety of reasons. Oh, this kind of meeting I love to be in the office for, or I need to get this work done. So I'm going to stay home so people leave me alone. Oh, my son has a soccer game. Um, I, staying home would be easier. Or I have, to bring, I have to go in later today. And I think that used to be a very weighty decision for people. Hey, if I'm going to decide to stay home today, I better have a good reason. And it's probably going to impact other schedules. And I think what we've learned over the last 13 months is that actually doesn't need to be a weighty decision. And that flexibility is going to be an important cultural component going forward for all businesses. And so we're trying to design our future, both in our physical office and our network infrastructure and virtual employees, so that that feels like a very easy decision that an employee can make on a day in day out basis of what's best for me today to get my job done. And then we just empower them to make that decision. So it means investing in what their home office looks like, the kind of equipment they have, investing in tools like NetBees for monitoring, and then proactively working with employees as we detect problems. Yeah. So you mentioned a new, um, a new office. Uh, what's, what's that office gonna look like, you know, I imagine the new office is going to look much different than what your original intent was when you when your company started uh, planning for it. For yeah, that. absolutely, Seamus. I say if you want an example of some of the world's worst uh, timing, is we signed a ten year lease a month before the pandemic sent us all home. Uh, on a brand new building to be built. Um, and so obviously there was a little consternation that we didn't know what the new normal is going to be and we just signed this 10 year lease. But I and the rest of the executive team is incredibly happy that we signed that lease because this new building gives us way more flexibility than our previous one. And we are designing a very fluid office set setting where I kind of think of our office as half office and half conferencing center. Meaning there are definitely employees who have clearly told us as soon as the office is open, I'm going to be back in the office for a variety of reasons. Some of them have no suitable place really to work from home. Some of them just can't get work done from home. Some of them prefer the office. They, they prefer the socialization. There's lots of good reasons. So we will have employees who are there in assigned cubicles or assigned offices three to five days a week, three to five days a week. And then there's a population of employees who told us like, hey, I, I, I want to come into the office, but I can't commit to which days I think it'll be. And I would like a little more flexibility. So we've designed another, the, the rest of the office, and by the way, it's all commingled. There's not like a, a floor by floor. Everything is commingled together. We've designed the rest of the capacity to be incredibly flexible. We're using technology like, so you can reserve it and every, and every uh, spot that you could sit in has a little visual display of whether this is reserved and how long it's reserved for. And then obviously we're doing investments in sanitation and health where once a person, the reservation is over, we don't free the resource up again until it's been cleaned and sanitized. It's those kinds of investments in the new world where lots of collaboration space, both open air collaboration and meeting rooms, lots of flexibility and you know being able to book space, including rooms and desks and collaboration. Um, and we really want employees to feel like this is kind of the the mothership they can return to at whatever period of time they want. And obviously some of our employees are going to be distant, distant remote as well, where you know that's a, a trip. So if they're going to come visit once a year or once a quarter or whatever the right ratio for them to come back to from, from wherever in the country they are, we want them to feel that it's a it's a warm, inviting place to come collaborate with their peers as well. Um, something just occurred to me. Um, these people that be coming to, to the office, working from home, they're, they're still going to have the NetBees agent on whether they're at home, uh, on their computer, whether they're in their home office or coming into your HQ. Have you figured out whether or not you're going to be leveraging that agent on the NetBees agent on the, those laptops uh, when those people are in the office? Yeah, that, it's a great question. We actually have spent some time thinking about it. 
Uh, obviously, because every employee has the can be working from home at any point in time, the agent will continue to be deployed on everyone's uh, everyone's device, whether they plan to be in the office or not. Because, you know, even though our CEO might be there five days a week, he also is going to you know might hit a problem on a weekend that we want to understand, or a weeknight, or he's on vacation and he's saying he's having issues. So, whether the person's plan is to be physically in the office or not, the agent will be there. And we've been trying to figure out what we think the right the right, obviously, I don't necessarily know that I want 300 devices all pinging the same server from the office. So we've been thinking about profile wise, like, do we want to activate and deactivate? Like, for instance, if the device detects our, our device, we hand out the text that we're on a work Wi-Fi network, do we want to like slow down the, the rate of ping or the rate of test? Or do we want to just pause until we're not no longer on a work? And so that's the kind of conversations we're currently having. We haven't exactly landed on what our solution will be, but that was a really insightful question in that, that I did have this moment of panic where I was like, okay, I'm going to have 400 people in the office and every single one of those machines is going to be pinging this server every five minutes. And that did make me a little nervous from all from the work network. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you can configure it so that like you can uh, have just one person, one part of the Wi-Fi network ping um, at any given time, or just have some some default that's shut off. Um, what do you, could you talk a little bit about um, what you're doing in those home office environments from an infrastructure perspective? I remember you telling me about like installing some Wi-Fi and some LTE gateways here and there. What's, what's sure. the status of that? Absolutely. So the first thing we did, uh, and obviously there's a lot of power in being a, a medium-sized business with only 250 employees at the time of the pandemic, we could act very incredibly quickly. So the minute we thought there was a possibility of shutting the office down, we immediately bought like 200 and 200, 300 monitors so that people could have identical setups at home as they have in the office. Um, we bought docking stations, we bought cabling, uh, so that essentially as we, over the seven to 10 days that we rolled out from being a fully uh, in office workforce to a fully remote, we had a whole process where we gave every single person, here's two monitors for home, here's a docking station, here's a ethernet cable in case you need it, and we started them out kind of a baseline. So that's where we started from. And now every new employee we've added since the pandemic has gotten kind of that same kit. They have two monitors at home. They have a docking station. Uh, if they need a desk, uh, they don't have desk. A desk, we can give we give them that as well. If they need a chair, we can give them that. So we kind of have a standard issue that we can give employees. Uh, and then we kind of have what I would call like a tree for debugging. So hey, we've got everything. We're seeing that they're having problems. Um, in some cases, uh, we'll give them like a an Eero type Wi-Fi system. Hey, we think it's just your Wi-Fi. You're like you're in the corner of the house. The Comcast router's in the other corner of the house. Your connection is really bad, but you probably have a good internet, but your Wi-Fi is bad. So we've we've solved some cases by giving them better kind of mesh Wi-Fi. Um, sometimes employees just live in a place where the the high speed internet is not great. So we've used backup LTE gateways as well. Um, and then, you know, the tried and true way has been, hey, if you're really stuck and nothing else is working, here's this 100 foot ethernet cable that no spouse likes have, go running through their house. But if everything is, if we can't figure out a better solution, that'll get us through, uh, uh, get us through the, the hump until we figure out how to, how to move forward. Yeah. So kind of that's our bag of tricks. Okay. All right. Um, any, anything else you want to talk about uh, before we uh, open it up to questions? No, I think that was uh, that was pretty much everything. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure it was uh, a lot. Uh, I, no one's ever accused me of being too quiet. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's um let's see if anyone has any questions for us. Um, now that we've gone through our our bit of the of the of the webinar. Do we have um. Do we have a moderator for the Q&A session? Yes, I can look into questions that we may have here. Give people a couple minutes. I don't know, Seamus, why, why people are, were collecting the questions. The one thing I don't know if you agree uh, is that I think the the one silver lining of this entire last 12 to 13 months is I think the cultural shift to remote work for a lot of companies, the getting over the mental hurdle of it being less productive or less efficient, it, it has accelerated, I think, probably a decade at least 
Um, you know, I know some companies have always been very remote friendly, but I think a lot of the companies, at least especially in financial services where I come from, had always been very hesitant to a remote remote based workforce, largely remote workforce. And I think it's really kind of accelerated that that openness to it that we've seen the reality that it really, I mean, there's definitely been downsides, don't get me wrong. And this is working in a pandemic is not the same as working remotely. There's, there is some slight differences for sure, but I do think it's gotten us over the hump of this being uh, impossible to do. Yeah, you know, it, there's a cultural piece here. Um, like I talked to a network architect at a, who was in the middle of changing jobs. He's going from one mid-sized regional bank to another. The bank he was leaving, they said, the day we come back, the, the day the day the pandemic is over, everyone's going back to the office. Like they're like like it like it never happened. You know, we're all going to be, and not only that, but we're going to an open office environment where everyone's going to be sitting in a row at a table with only like two feet separating them, if that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and no one's going to have a cubicle anymore, uh, which is horrifying for people who have been maintaining social distance for more than a year. Uh, he said the new company he was going to, another you know, $20, $50 billion bank, was embracing what you've done. Um, we, are, we are never going to make anyone come back to the office again. You know, except for the retail banking part, you know, we need some people in the bank branches, but, but we're giving people total freedom to work in the way that they need to. Um, so now that I'm done talking, I'll turn Well, it looks back. like we have some questions that have come in. Okay. Uh, first, it's a anonymous attendee. Seems like remote work has been very popular with financial services firms, especially. Any thoughts on why these firms may be the biggest adopters of remote work. That could be either one of you guys. Could be Seamus, you or Brian. Um, well, I, 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 I haven't noticed that. I, I, I think there's, there are multi, multiple industries where it's happening. I mean, technology companies, for instance, have really, really embraced remote work as well. I, I heard, heard from one high tech company with 5,000 employees who ordered 5,000 SD-WAN gateways for 5,000 home offices with LTE radio backup. So, I mean, it's 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 in a, it's happening in a few industries, but I'll, I'll, I don't know if Brian has any thoughts about his own industry that he wants to add. Sure, I, I would say that I, you know, I think it's relative. It was surprising to me how many of the giant money center banks quickly adopted it and even have made statements like we're not making any decisions for all of 2021 as to what we're going to do going forward. I think historically that was super surprising to consider how culturally the office was important. Um, the, the skeptic in me says it has to do with the fact that there is an opportunity from that they view that if this works, that they can really reduce their costs uh, as far as real estate and office and space like that so that there's a huge benefit because what the one trend you saw pre-pandemic was a lot of these companies were taking their large swaths of employees and moving them to less expensive areas. So I'm not, I'm just even within the United States, it's like you know a lot of uh, banks were moving out of Wilmington and moving to like northern New Jersey or you know uh, in some cases like Austin, Texas. They were their tax incentives were driving uh, real estate prices. Also, were driving them to move to other areas where they could get lower cost bases. And I think. The pandemic just gave them an evolution of like, oh, this could be another way. I'm not saying that's the only reason they did it. I think they did it because it was the right thing to do to keep their employees safe. But as they looked at it and said, wow, our cost basis for giving all these employees a place to work is incredibly high. And so I do think that there's a little bit of a self-serving, we can lower our cost base uh, there as well. And I think that they were the ones I expected to be the, le the most resistant. And the fact that they a lot of them quickly moved really did kind of surprise me as well. It made me feel like, oh, wow, they are pretty flexible. So that was, there was, that was we had some local press isolating. Uh, they were talking about the neighborhoods that had been so depleted, you know, during COVID. And lo and behold, the financial services area, I mean, some of the nice high real estate areas of San Francisco were seeing a massive uh, depletion in terms of, you know, people just moving out. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. The other question I, I see, did you return to pre, do you see a return to pre-COVID? I think you kind of already answered that um, with your slide, talking about this whole flex 
work mentality. So I think we've answered that. And I, I think you also answered what it was about net fees that caught your attention. You were doing Google search, you were looking for user experience monitoring, anything else, I, you know? Yeah, I, I, say that, I say that when I did my research, uh, it was few and far between. I'd find companies who had, oh, you can buy this piece of hardware, or you know, if you have this already, this will work. Then the thing that really uh, drove me towards Epi's to reaching out was the idea that I could just install an agent uh, on individual machines, uh, individual you know pieces of hardware that I you know laptops that we give out to people, and that agent could you know quick we could easily roll that out using our existing tools for rolling out software. Uh, so the the ability to quickly roll it out, the low upfront investment, it really got me interested and was able to make our deployment go incredibly fast. When you first uh, made the pivot to remote, what was what really kept you up at night when this when this thing was underway, and you know what drove you to to that you know googling and, and looking for the, what, what what were your top two or three like I would say worries as CIO? Sure, and I, I think this is very aligned to what our CEO's worries were because uh, I think he he's defined a culture that you know I've bought into a hundred percent, and that we have a culture of uh, what we call productive conflict. So this is, you know, we challenge each other and we have arguments and, you know, we, we, we stay collegial and we don't get, you know, we're not doing name calling, but like conflict is a big part of our culture. Like we're, we're, we're encouraged to challenge each other's decisions to hash things out in meetings. Uh, and so that means those meetings are incredibly important to our culture. Um, we like to have communication and, and, and you know, as be face-to-face -face as possible. So you know, our video conferencing system was a critical part to maintaining that culture. We also do things like weekly um, all hands meetings with every single employee uh, and with a topic. And so the ability to have everyone pay attention to that and log in, um, that was what was keeping me up at night. It would, you'd think it would be like, you know, the you know ability to make phone calls and that's all important. I knew we would solve that, but you know, our CEO was worried about it, which makes me worried about it was, hey, how are we gonna maintain our culture during this time? And when you're relying on something like video conferencing software that is so reliant on stability of network connections and bandwidth and all sorts of things you don't control, that really is what had me the most worried was, hey, uh, you know, we have to maintain everything we've built over the past six years while we're doing this. And that's what drove me to the decisions that we made. Interesting. Well, it looks like we have one more question. And it, it's really kind of a speculative question about how companies will do, will fare, that push everyone back to the office and say, we're going back to the normal and you're just gonna have to live with it. Uh, what do you think about the fate of those types of companies? Uh, Seamus, I can go first, then you can uh, go as well. I feel like I'm doing all the talking, I apologize for that. Um, I, it's, a, it's a very uh, great question. I literally was just in a conversation uh, this morning about that and I said, that I believe the ability to work remotely will be a company advantage and attrition will directly correlate to companies and flexibility in the new world. So assume that the pandemic is no longer a concern health-wise, but we've opened this, we've opened this Pandora's box of remote work, and I think it's a, a good box that we opened. I think companies who refuse to allow people to work remotely are going to lose employees and you're not going to be able to compete. Um, I don't know that, you know, some companies culture and benefits will, out, will, will overcome that, but I feel like, especially in certain areas and technology, it's going to be a competitive disadvantage to not allow people to work remotely. Yeah, I, I agree. Seamus, what do you think? I agree too. I mean, you think about it, there's like a mental health aspect to this. There are a lot of people who have been very careful uh, for well over a year now who have maintain uh, social distance, sheltered at home as much as possible, work from home productively during all of that, despite all the stress and distraction. And um, any company that tries to force those people to come back to an office setting before they're comfortable, before they've had a chance to like get comfortable being around people again is making a huge mistake. I mean, you got someone who's been working from home for, for well over a year who has you know found a way to make themselves feel safe doing that and then you're going to tell them they have to go back into a cubicle setting where um hundreds of people around them are breathing <laughs> it's, i think about this like i remember you know flying a lot <laughs> for work and seeing that there'd be maybe one 
person on the plane wearing a, a mask, right, pre-pandemic. And I think to myself, what's that person scared of? What, <laughs> what are they doing? Uh, you know, now I know that they were, one, trying to protect themselves from a legitimate concern, which was disease, <laughs> and two, probably trying to protect the, and or two, trying to protect the people around them. There is more awareness of the danger now. I mean, every year, hundreds, like tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people around the world have died of the flu. Um, no one, there was no massive um, casualties to loss to the flu this year. The flu did not happen this year because everyone was keeping each other safe. Everyone was masked. Everyone was staying away from each other. And we just, we just accepted that there was a certain amount of risk that we were willing to live with, where a certain number of thousands of people would die from the flu every year. Now, we just went through this event where we, um, our, this one country, the United States, lost half a million people and counting um, to a, a, a disease that was novel to us, but has changed our perspective on what it means to protect ourselves and the people around us. And I think even after the pandemic is over, that is gonna be a, a thing that people are thinking about, like for, for, for now on, like, is it, is it worth it going back into the office when I have um, uh, comorbidities that could also uh, let the, the flu kill me, you know? So flexibility, is going to be a major uh, uh, um, competitive advantage for employers moving forward. And the ability to, to provide a good user experience for people who are trying to be productive from home is going to be really important moving forward. Well, I wanna thank both you guys for participating uh, in the webinar. Seamus, Brian, your input was invaluable. Um, for anyone that wants more information, you can obviously come to our website and at netbees.net. We've got tons of webinars, case studies, and some great content that uh, we think you'll also enjoy. So Brian, Seamus, thank you guys very much. Jess, thank you for the introduction.